السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على عبده ونبيه ومصطفى سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد I praise Allah the Almighty alone and I send the best peace and blessings upon his most beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم Dear brothers and sisters welcome to another recorded episode where we answer some of your pending questions uh, the upcoming questions uh, we received on the Facebook page, which as a quick reminder, the address for this page is www.facebook.com forward slash msalah official. The first question we have here is, what is the name of the bird who conveyed the message of Bilqais to Prophet Suleiman? And what is the lesson from this event? Can this bird be eaten? Uh, the question is asked by Al Qasim Mustafa. The name of the bird is Al Hudhud. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Sulaiman alayhi salam, What a faqqad al tayra. Faqala ma liya la ara al hudhuda am kana min al ghaibin. That Sulaiman alayhi salam was inspecting his horse and the hudhud was missing. He said, was wrong. I don't see the hood hood, which is in English a bird with a crown, which is known as the hoopoe. Has beautiful colors and a very neat crown. Normally, it picks the worms from uh, the field. Um, so, that is the name. As far as whether it can be eaten or not. Now, number one, the bird nowadays has become very rare due to using insecticides in the field which kills the worms and the, the hood hood as well and other birds. But even if it is available, uh, there is a difference of opinion whether it is permissible to eat it or not. The difference uh, is as a result of a hadith which is collected by Imam Ahmad and uh, narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas. May Allah be pleased with him. In this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam Naha an qatli arba'im min ad dawab forbid killing for animals. An namlatu wal nahlatu wal hudhud wal surad. An namla is the ant, an nahla is the honeybee, and al hudhud is the hoopoe, which is the subject of our conversation, and al surad is a bird which is a little smaller than uh, the mockingbird, for instance, or al usfur. In any case, and Nabi Sallallahu also forbade killing al dufda which is um, the frog. And that's why the scholars said if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi forbade killing uh, these creatures, then it is not permissible to slaughter them for eating. Unless if they are harmful, that's something else. But killing the ants, the honeybees, al hudhud or al surad normally, and al dufda which is uh, the frog, uh, is prohibited as I mentioned earlier in the hadith. Uh, according to the Maliki school of uh, thought and others, it is permissible to eat it because it, this bird does not kill, does not have canines, is not one of uh, the wild animals, it does not eat filth and accordingly they said it is uh, permissible to eat it. As I said in the beginning, it should not really be a big deal because it is not very much available nowadays. Yes, we see it in some parts of America, in some fields where they have uh, organic fields. They do not spread or spray uh, uh, insecticides. Uh, so these animals may prosper there. The second question is from uh, Farmina from India. The sister is asking, is it permissible to recite the Quran while lying down? Also, is it necessary to cover our hair and our in general while reciting the Quran? 
Uh, as far as the first part of the question, yes, it is permissible to recite the Quran while sitting, while lying down, while reclining, while walking, while exercising. It is okay to recite the Quran in any of these conditions, particularly if you're reclining and paying attention, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al Imran, in ayah number 191. الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار So in this ayah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised those who reflect and ponder the creation of Allah because the previous ayah says إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لأولي الألباب Verily in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of the day and the night there are signs, proofs for people who ponder and reflect for people of intellect who are they? the following ayah describe them as يذكرون الله الذين يذكرون الله those who remember Allah, who praise Allah, and glorify Allah. Qiyaman, while standing. Waqu'udan, while sitting down. Wa'ala junubihim, wa reclining on their sides. Wa'yatafakkaruna, and they think about fi khalq samawati wal ard. They think about the creation of the heavens and the earth. So, mere uh, dhikrullah azza wa jal, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa reclining is permissible. Add to that, there is a sound hadith which is narrated by the mother of the believers, Aisha radiyallahu anha. In this hadith, she said, and the hadith is collected by Al-Bukhari wa Muslim, كَانَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ يَتَّكِئُ فِي حِجْرِي وَأَنَا حَائِضٌ ثُمَّ يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنِ So this is like a straightforward reference in this regard. She said, may Allah be pleased with her, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to recline and he would put his head in my lap and he would recite the Qur'an in this condition while I would be in my menses. Obviously, these indications are very important and a straightforward reply to the Jewish practice at this time when they considered a woman during her menses a physical impurity so that they cannot touch her and she cannot cook for them, they cannot shake hands with her and a man would avoid uh, his spouse or the woman in his house who's having the menses. So there came the Prophet ﷺ to prove the opposite is absolutely valid. Aisha radiallahu anha also narrated that the Prophet ﷺ would pick the same spot after I have drank and he would put his lips on the same spot and would drink after me. That's in her idda, in, in her, I'm sorry, that's in her menses, okay, in the hayd. And also the Prophet وسلم, she would give him or he would give her uh, the meat and she would take a bite. Then the Prophet وسلم, would make a point to take a bite from the same spot. وسلم, and may Allah be pleased with the mother of the believers. As far as the reciting the Quran while not covering the awra, it needs some explanation. First of all, he mentioned the hair. The hair is a awra before an unmahram, and you're not required to cover the hair while reciting the Quran, because this is not similar to praying. So if you would like to, may Allah bless you, but it is not required. But the other awra, because he said, or the awra, if you're talking about the major awra, which is the private al-qubul wa dubur there is a hadith which is collected by Imam al-Tirmidhi and Bahz ibn Hakim from his father, from his grandfather. He said, his grandfather, the grandfather of Bahz ibn Hakim said, Ya Rasulallah, awratuna ma na'ti minha wa ma nadar. Faqala, ay sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ihfaz awrataka illa min zawjika aw ma malakat yaminu. You should cover up your awra except from your spouse, your wife, and or مَا مَلَكَتْ يَمِينُكْ Position what your right hand possessed, that was in the past, now it has been seized. So the Prophet وسلم, said, what it means, that no one should look at your awra that's pertaining the major awra, the Prophet, except your spouse. Okay, 
Then Muawiyah, may Allah be pleased with him, who is known as Muawiyah ibn Hayda, radiyallahu an, said, Ya Rasulullah, فَإِنْ كَانَ أَحَدُنَا خَالِيَا What if one of us is sitting alone, if home by himself or herself, can he be freely nude? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah أَحَقُّ أَنْ يُسْتَحْيَا مِنْهُ مِنَ النَّاسِ You're not alone, Allah is seeing you. So Allah is more worthy to feel shy before him, more than feeling shy from people. So no one should be entirely in the nude and walking around home, unless if he's taking a bath or in the washroom, this is a different condition. But to walk around in the nude, the Prophet said, Allah أَحَقُّ أَنْ يُسْتَحْيَا مِنْهُمْ uh, the next question is from brother Aman, didn't specify where is he from, maybe her. But Aman in Arabic normally would go for uh, a masculine. He said, please comment on the absolute authenticity and preservation of the Holy Quran. There is only one ayah can cover this whole subject, ayah number 9 of Surah Al-Hijr. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna nahnu nazzalna al-zikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. <coughs> Excuse me. That is the greatest reference. Certainly it was us. It is us who sent down the zikr, the revelation, the Quran. Wa inna lahu lahafidun. And certainly we shall preserve it. The only book which received the attention from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of the preservation was the Quran. There are tons of physical proofs, of course, such as that the Quran is the only book which has only one version. While is the Torah and the Gospel have many versions, for instance, Al-Injil uh, uh, Al or the Bible, many, many versions. And the funniest part is when you hear in the news that the latest edition of the Bible is already in the bookstores. So if the book supposedly the holy book, the book of God, is subject to editing by human beings, then I cannot call it the book of God anymore because I don't know, uh, I cannot be certain which statement is Allah's statement and which statement was edited or added by a human being, no matter who is this human being. In, <coughs> in Islam, certainly there is not a single word in the Quran which is the word of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rather, the Quran is distinct from the Sunnah in this regard. That's why the companions in the beginning were reluctant to write the Ahadith because it was only uh, writing down and recording and writing and scribing was limited to the Quran. The whole Quran was written down and documented in writing at the time of its revelation over 23 years. And by many companions, Ali ibn Abi Talib was one of the scribes, uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, Zaid ibn Thabit, and others. So the Quran was written down. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud used to have some scripture, and this companion and that companion, in addition to it was compiled all in the heart of the Prophet وسلم, and in the heart of many of the companions. We know that during the event of Hadith al Rajiyah and Bi'r Ma'una, there were over 70 companions of the Prophet وسلم, of the Hufaz who had been killed or assassinated. So, at his life, during his life, there was that many companions who have memorized the Quran and more, of course. Uh, after the Battle of Al Yamama, when Muslims were fighting ab uh, against and Musaylim al-Kazzab and many Hufaz uh, have been murdered. Uh, it was Umar ibn Khattab who suggested to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, why don't we collect all the Quran which is written in a scripture here and there sometimes on the shoulders of the, the bone, the clavicle bone of uh, a camel because it was very broad, animal skin, trees, stones. We collect all of that and put it in one book, compile it in one book compile what has been already documented. And there is a general consensus between the Sahaba 
and the scholars and attabi'een and everybody that there is only one copy of the Quran and anyone who has a doubt that any word of the Quran is not from it or the Quran is missing any part is a disbeliever because there is one thing that the Ummah has a general consensus in this regard which is the Quran fully from cover to cover from Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen to Surat An-Nas Min Al-Jinnati wa nas is definitely the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anyone who doubts a word or even a letter is not a Muslim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised so and it will continue to be preserved until the day of judgment because there will not be any other revelation nor wahi or prophethood after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and after the Quran Sister Sadiqa from Atlanta, Georgia Sister Sadiqa says, praying with my eye closed helps me to focus. When I pray with my eyes open, all sorts of distractions come to my mind. Is this permissible? Yani, is it permissible to close my eyes while praying? Al-Jumhur is a term that refers to the vast majority of the Muslim jurists. Al-Fuqaha of the Sharia are of the view that it is dislike to close your eyes while praying. Why? They relied on a hadith that is collected by a tabarani fil kabir wal awsat narrated by Abdullah ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, that he said, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا قَامَ أَحَدُكُمْ فِي الصَّلَاةِ فَلَا يُغْمِضْ عَيْنَيْهِ Whenever any of you stand up to pray, he should not close his eyes. Okay? So they said, Based on this hadith, it is dislike to close your eyes for the following reasons. Because you look like asleep, especially if you're praying taraweeh or a long prayer behind the imam. Once you close your eyes, if you're afraid that you will be distracted when you open your eyes, you will be much more distracted because you're going to fall asleep and, always, and, and, and also dream meanwhile. This is what they say. Also, you'll be missing the sunnah. Practicing what sunnah? Which is looking at the spot of the sujood. Mawda as sujood. So, they said in the salah, every body part should be involved in the ibadah. We move our hands, we bow down, we place our forehead and the nose, and the knees and the toes, even the aynayn, the eyes, also get involved in the ibadah by looking at mawda as sujood. So, you shouldn't be missing this sunnah. Some of the fuqaha, such as Al-Imam Al-Nawawi, may Allah have mercy on him. Imam Al-Nawawi was not only the compiler of Riyadh Al-Salihin and the 40 Nawawi Hadith, he also explained Sahih Al-Imam Muslim and he was a great faqih. May Allah uh, have mercy on him. He is of the view that it is not disliked whatsoever to close your eyes. As a matter of fact, if it brings more khushua, tranquility and serenity for the person who is praying while closing his or her eyes, then it becomes recommended. Whatever suits you most. I feel very comfortable with that. If you believe that by closing your eyes, you will be much more focused and you will have more khushua, then it is permissible to do so. Um, Sister Noura Ahmed, her question is, is a girl's father, uh, does if, if a girl's father does not fulfill his rights, can the uncle from the father's side be the wali? Well, I guess she's asking about in case of marriage, if the father is not uh, a person who's fit to be the wali. But who can judge this case? In many cases, we know that if the girl is in love with a person or another and the father or the guardian, whoever is the guardian, disagrees, right away she starts looking around for uh, an alternative. The wali is not fit, the wali lies, the wali does this, does that. And in many cases, by Investigating the wali is fed, is a religiously committed person, etc. But he disagrees to this person because he's not a fit person, he's not a good person. 
is simply like that. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the hadith, which is collected by Ibn Hibban wal Hakim in their same collection, لا نكاح إلا بولي لا نكاح it negates and nullifies a marriage which has been done or a marriage contract which has been processed without the consent of the guardian. أي ممرأة نكحت بغير إذن وليها فنكاحها باطل فنكاحها باطل. This another hadith which was collected by five of the collectors of the ahadith. Any woman who gives herself in marriage without the consent of her guardian, her marriage is batil. Batil. Batil means invalid, nullified. And furthermore, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَإِنْ دَخَلَ بِهَا فَلَهَا الْمَهْرُ بِمَا اسْتَحَلَّ مِنْ فَرْجِهَا Even if they happen to consummate the marriage, the marriage has to be undone and she will be eligible for the dowry because there was a consummation but the marriage is still invalid فَإِنِ اشْتَجَرُوا فَالسُّلْطَانُ وَلِيُّ مَنْ لَا وَلِيَّ لَهُ What if they differ? The wali, the guardian with the girl, the different guardians over one girl, then a sultan, if she doesn't have a wali even, a sultan, the ruler, the governor, or his deputy, or those whom he appoints, uh, to take care of people's uh, affairs and cases, the judge, the imam, the emir, okay, the mayor, he should be in a charge and he should be the wali of a woman whom she does not have a wali or she has a wali who is stubborn or a wali who is not fit. Yani if a wali, let him be the father, the uncle, the grandfather, the brother, he is the appointed wali according to his order, according to the order which I will explain shortly. But he doesn't pray, he's a fasiq, he's rebellious at least because he doesn't pray. Or he drinks, or, or. In this case, this person is a wali, but he's not qualified to be the guardian. So if a righteous person came to propose to his girl and he refuses, she has the right to take the case to a superior person or an authority person or a case, uh, take the case to the judge so that the walaya will be confiscated from this person and will be given to the next in order. The sister here said that, can my uncle from father's side, yani paternal uncle, be my wali? Well, it is not up to us or up to you. Rather, the walaya in order as follows. Number one, the father and ascending. Yani if the father is not there or if he's there and he's not fit or we cannot locate him, he's missing. Then the grandfather, then the great grandfather. Okay, if not, we go to the descending, the son and the grandson. But she is uh, a, a girl, she's not been married or she doesn't have children. Then the brother, the brother, al akhu al-shaqiq from the two parents. If not, uh, the brother who shares the brotherhood and the sisterhood with the sister from her father's side. They are brother and sister from the same father. And uh, afterward, we go to the nephew. All of that before we even think about the uncle. Okay, so that is the order as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, of course, the system has been put in the inheritance and will follow it accordingly. <coughs> if there is no such wali, if they are all not fit, then the guardian could be the mayor, the judge, the imam of the masjid. But a woman should not give herself in marriage without the consent of her guardian. Uh, <coughs> Sister Laura from the UK. Laura says, my non-Muslim sister needs financial help in getting married. Is it permissible for me to help her? Yes, of course. You will be rewarded as well, even if she's not Muslim, provided you're not helping her from the zakah money. A zakah is only for Muslims. But voluntary charity, yes, you will be rewarded for assisting her to get married, of course. And make sure that this money would not be spent in haram, like in the party or buying alcohol or whatever. Buying the basic needs, appliance, the rent, all of that is valid. 
بارك الله فيكم and let's take a short break إن شاء الله we'll resume in a couple of minutes stay tuned السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه وبعد uh, The following question is from sister Sayyida or Sayyidia Sayyid Her question is what is uh, Druid and which one or which form is authentic and The Druid is an old word which refers to التحيات uh, or التشهد uh, in the prayer in fact, there are many forms, many sound and authentic form. For instance, one form which you can adhere to if you want to, to say At-tahiyyat lillah wa salawat wa tayyibat. As-salamu alayka ayyuha al-nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. There is a part which will be recited in the middle tashahud of any prayer. Okay, there is a slight difference in another view according to a sound collection narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu an. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sat me in front of him and he took my hand between two, uh, his two hands and he said, Ya Abdullah, and he taught me how to recite At-Tahiyyat. He said, At-Tahiyyat lillah wa salawat wa tayyibat Assalamu alayka ayyuha al-nabi. Notice he said, Assalamu alayka ayyuha al-nabi. Which means, peace be upon you, O the Prophet. With the second person. He is addressing the Prophet ﷺ because he is present. He said, so when the Prophet ﷺ, and of course he continued the same form. He said, when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, we used to say, Assalamu ala al-nabi. Peace be upon the Prophet, addressing the third person because his absence. The vast majority of the scholars and the companions are of the view that no, we say Assalamu alayka because the Prophet did not command otherwise. Okay? So whether you say this according to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud or you stick to the opinion of Al Jumhur and you say what the Prophet taught his companions when he was alive. Assalamu alayka ayyuha al-nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Both are valid uh, Then In the last tashahud Before making taslim You recite the previous part And you add to the drood Or send in the peace and the blessings Upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam And his family His blessed family members So you say Allahumma salli ala muhammadin Wa ala ali muhammad كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد We all understand the meaning of this part of sending the peace and the blessings upon the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and his family the same way that he did bless and send his salutation upon Prophet Ibrahim السلام, and his family and innaka hamidun majid you are all worthy of praise and uh, worthy of exaltation now uh, the following question is from brother Shamsuddin Junaid Shamsuddin says can clothing be worn below the ankles obviously he means in the case of men, because women should cover their feet with their clothes. Uh, this is something which is known as al-isbal. Al-isbal is to lower your clothes, your pants, your trousers, your thobe, your izar beneath the, ankle, uh, the ankles. And this is something that the Prophet ﷺ forbade men, forbade his companions from doing. In one hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, ما أسفل من الكعبين من الإزار في النار. 
and this is the sound hadith which is collected by Imam al-Bukhari. So he said, uh, whoever or whichever, uh, whoever wears clothes that go beneath his ankles, this part will be in fire. May Allah protect us. And also in another hadith, he said, Man jarra thawbahu khuyala alam yanzur illahu ilayhi yawma al-qiyama. And this hadith is agreed upon its authenticity. Whoever will drag his clothes out of arrogance, out of showing off and pride, Allah would not look at him on the day of judgment. This is a serious threat and a serious warning. What we're trying to say is, we have two ahadith. The second, some people understood it as, only those who wear long trousers or clothes out of pride, out of arrogance, because amongst the Arab back then, a person would be known as a, a noble person belonging to an honorable family. Whenever he wears a longer outfit, sabir, long sleeves, and his clothes are dragging behind him, and so on. So they say the restriction has a illa or an effective cause, which is the pride and the arrogance. And they also said when Abu Bakr radiallahu an said, Ya Rasulallah, Sometimes, because he was kind of skinny, my izar would fall undeliberately, indeliberately. The Prophet ﷺ said, you're not one of those. Yani, you're not one of those who do this out of arrogance or pride. So that's why we have these two different opinions. But the safest and the best is to avoid wearing anything that goes beneath the ankles. As Umar ibn Khattab radiyallahu an saw a young man, a shab, a youth, visited him at the time of his death. Subhanallah, when somebody is dying and is in pain, he focuses on his own dilemma. But he saw somebody who was wearing his clothes who were going beneath his ankles. He said, radiyallahu an, irfa' thawbaka fa innahu atqa li thawbika wa arda li rabbik. Pick up or raise your thawb, your izar. Uh, so that they won't go beneath your ankles because this is better for you thawb as far as the tahara it won't touch the impurities in the suit and arda li rabbik it will be more pleasing to your lord because this is what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, will be happy with because the prophet sallallahu ordered so now the following question is from sister aisha from sierra leone uh, she says, does the husband have to be present when his wife is given birth? I would take the verb have as a wajib. No, it is not a wajib, but it is very important. It is very comforting and supporting. Uh, whenever the woman is given birth, she needs a full support. And the closest person to her, even closer to her, their own parents, is the husband. Sharing this moment is very important. But what if the person was abroad, if the person had a valid excuse, the woman should pardon, should not keep this in mind and keep reminding him and make it like a complex that they revolve around it all the time and she keeps remembering this for him. If it is something that it was out of his control, he was not negligent of that or uh, once uh, I wanted to attend the, the delivery and the physician said, uh, the doctor said, no, you can't. So I had to stand outside. Uh, in some places they allowed them not only to attend but video camera this delivery and I said, be aware of this. This is not permissible. Okay. So if, if it is accessible, the person should really support his wife and stand next to her. But if it is not accessible, it is not a wajib though. <clears throat> Sister Latifa has a question. Her question is, please explain reciting the tashahud when joining a congregational prayer late. And uh, her second question, what should we look for when picking an Islamic school for our children? As far as the first question, I guess I just mentioned earlier, uh, at tashahud and the part which to be recited in the middle tashahud and the part which to be recited fully the tashahud then send in the peace and the blessings upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the last sitting and tashahud before making taslim 
Her question is, if somebody attended the Jama'ah late, and the Imam, for instance, is now reciting the last Tashahud, and for me, this is my second Raka'ah, then this is your middle Tashahud, according to the more right view, according to the Hadith, in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, فَمَا أَدْرَكْتُمْ فَصَلُّوا وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُّوا when you join the Imam, walk regularly, do not rush, and whatever position you join the Imam in, enter the Salah and join him immediately. And this is going to be the first part of your prayer. How did we know that? Because he said, وَمَا فَاتَكُمْ فَأَتِمُّوا And whatever you missed, complete it. And when I say complete, so I begin by counting one, two, three, four. So my very first rak'ah with the Imam, despite that it was his second, third, or fourth, is the first for me because I have to complete afterward. So the first rak'ah for me, I get to recite Al-Fatiha, and if I get to recite uh, another surah or a few ayat, I will because this is a sunnah. But this is the third rak'ah for the Imam. Fine, but it is my first rak'ah. And the second for me is my second rak'ah, even though it is the fourth for the Imam. As far as picking an Islamic school and what should we look for, you know, I'm very skeptical when it comes to labeling anything with Islamic. Uh, we have to be very cautious because we see somebody who's selling tires, Islamic tires. Uh, selling properties, Islamic uh, real estate, uh, Islamic whatever, Islamic slaughterhouse. You know, what I really count is the practice if the person is dealing Islamically or not. I put my kids in an Islamic school and when I visited the school uh, or when I was planning to put my kids and apply for them in the school, I saw the teachers wearing jeans, women wearing jeans and tight blouses and so on. They were not uh, discipline whatsoever. They were not following the Sharia ah in their outfit, in their appearance, in their clothes. And they teach music. It's Islamic school, so-called Islamic school. So I have to visit the school. I have to check on the curriculums, their teachers, meet with the principal. And when you see the principal, uh, if, she, uh, if it is a female, and she herself is not dressed up properly, that's a sign that guess what? Everybody will be almost like that or even worse. So these are very important things. Go to the school on a school day during the scholastic year, visit it, see the students, see uh, if it is uh, possible to attend one class. This is very important. This is what you should look at. I don't care about the name. If there is a school which is named Madrasatul Imam al-Bukhari or Al-Madrasa, whatever, to me, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't help me making the decision. What would assist me in making the decision is examining the school and their lifestyle on daily basis. That would help me to make up my mind uh, to decide to send my school there or not, uh, my children in this school or not. Um, Sister Zina from the Philippines. Her question is, some people say that engraving one of the names of Allah on a ring and wearing it is, from, uh, is a form of protection. Is this true? As far as wearing a ring, it is permissible for men and women to wear uh, rings. For men, it is a sunnah because the Prophet ﷺ used to wear a silver ring. And his ring had some engraving on its stone, which was a stone from Abyssinia. The engraving had Muhammadur Rasulullah because he also used it as a stamp to seal up his messages with. And in the hadith that Abu Bakr Siddiq have inherited this ring from the Prophet وسلم, then Umar ibn al-Khattab, then Uthman ibn Affan, and once while Uthman was fetching water from one of the wells, the ring dropped from his finger and it fell in that uh, well, and that was the last uh, time that the ring was seen. And the Prophet ﷺ would turn the stone to the inside, not uh, because it had Muhammad Rasulullah. 
So when you enter al-khala or the washroom or answer the call of nature, you need to cover it up because of the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, if a woman is wearing a necklace or anything that has the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, she should conceal it when answering the call of nature. Now, a few days ago, and I was in one of the countries giving a few lectures, and some families asked me the significance of wearing a ring, and I said it is permissible, and the Prophet sallallahu used to wear a ring, etc. So one sister said, so it does not provide any protection? I said, definitely not. I came to find out that some Shia and some sects believe that the ring is a mean of protection and it is, a, it is a talisman, it brings a good luck to the extent that I investigated and I found that they forged some a hadith and this ascribed to Ali radiyallahu an that he said that pertaining certain stones it will give you ease, it will protect you from every harm and I would like to say there is no much difference between this practice and this belief and the belief of the Meccan pagans were they used to worship st uh, statues and idols and so on. Because believing in a stone, believing in anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it can provide any protection, benefit, or protect against any harm. Uh, this is disbelief. This is literally shirk. So I don't want to quote their hadith because they specify certain stones. If you wear a ring with the stone, no harm would befall you. That is not true. That is not true. The means of protection is in reciting the mu'awwidhat and al ruqya upon yourself and upon the people whom you'd like to do so. Not by wearing the Qur'an in your pocket or in your necklace or give it a glove compartment or whatever. Uh, <coughs> the following question is from our brother Abdullah from Nigeria. His question is, I began praying Asr and when, and then I realized that I didn't pray the noon prayer, which is Dhuhr. What should I have done? Once you begin a Fard prayer, you should not leave the prayer until you finish it up. لا تبطلوا أعمالكم. You should not ruin your deeds. Unless if the person realizes that he's missing wudu or he void his wudu, even during the prayer he should get up because there is no prayer without wudu. لا صلاة بغير طهور. So in this case, you finish your Asr prayer. What about the missed prayer which is Dhuhr? In the sound hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ نَامَ عَنْ صَلَاةٍ أَوْ نَسِيَهَا فَلْيُصَلِّهَا مَتَى ذَكَرَهَا The hadith is collected by Imam Muslim. Whoever oversleeps or forgets about any prayer, let him make it up once he remembers it or once he wakes up, wakes up of course. So if you wake up and you realize that you missed one prayer, you pray innocently. But what if the time of the following prayer has entered already? You begin with the one which you missed because many of the scholars are of the view that at-tartib is wajib. To pray the five daily prayers in order, Fajr before Dhuhr and Dhuhr before Asr, Asr before Maghrib and Maghrib before Isha is a must. So in this case, you pray, you, you finish your Asr. And that would count as enough because you will pray Dhuhr, which you have missed, you make it up, then you pray Asr again. Okay. Uh, Imran Muhammad has a question. Is it permissible to permanently remove hair? Obviously, uh, he's referring to the hair which is recommended to be removed, okay, such as uh, underarm hair, the pubic hair. It is permissible if it is safe and it doesn't have side effects, no problem, because this hair anywhere, uh, anyway was uh, instructed by the Prophet Sallallahu to be removed. And it counts as among the Sunan of the pure nature, the traditions of the pure nature for men and women as well. But removing any hair 
which is not permissible to be removed, such as the beard for men, becomes haram. And if you do it permanently, that's a permanent haram. That's a bigger sin. Okay. Uh, I believe that is the only hair which can uh, be removed, the facial hair or the armpit or the pubic hair. Um, well, we just ran out of time and inshallah Azza Jal, in another episode we'll continue answering your pending questions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us what we don't know and grant us knowledge, increase us in knowledge and help us to act upon what we have learned. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech